welcome. I'm gonna give people a little bit of time to join the Zoom and get settled in. Um, well, we're doing that. Uh, we are gonna drop some things in the chat. We are gonna ask uh, you to uh, introduce yourselves in the chat as you're coming in. Um, I should say first, my name is Timothy. I'm with Wild Rumpus. We are a uh, bookstore for young readers and the young at heart based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so as you're coming in, we would love to get a sense of where you're zooming in from um, and how many people you're with. If you have kids with you, uh, how old those kids are. If you could drop that in the chat for us, we would love to see uh, where you're coming in from. Um, and there is a, a way you can, uh, if you want everyone to see your answer, change your message, your chat function to panelists and attendees. Uh, otherwise, uh, that chat goes just to us, um, which is fine as well. Um, I think people are still kind of coming in. We're doing okay. Um, excellent. So I'm going to quick do an introduction and then turn things over. Uh, we have two folks uh, with us today, both from uh, Monarch Joint Venture uh, in some capacity, uh, as well as uh, the author of this uh, wonderful book, uh, Monarch Butterflies. It's got a gorgeous cover, gorgeous art. I'm excited to uh, hear and read from it. So I'm going to uh, read some quick uh, bios and then uh, we'll get into things. Uh, so with us today, we have Ella Phillips, who's the development director at Monarch Joint Venture, where she coordinates fundraising initiatives. She was born in Illinois and lived in Chicago for many years before moving to the great state of Minnesota. Uh, when not immersed in fundraising, Ella enjoys knitting, hiking, gardening, and spending time with her cat, friends, and family. It sounds like a fantastic way to do things. Uh, and also with us today is Anne Hobby, who is the author of this book and is the chair of the board of directors at Monarch Joint Venture. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Anne and Ella talk a little bit about Monarch Joint Venture. Um, so I won't get into that, but uh, Anne has uh, more than 20 years of experience teaching children, training teachers, and writing curriculum related to monarchs, schoolyard ecology, and schoolyard gardening. Hobby holds an MA in curriculum and instruction, and in addition to working with children and teachers, she specializes in education policy for nonprofits, helping the public understand and support public education in Minnesota. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn my camera off and turn things over to Anne and Ella. Great. Ella's going to say a few words at the end. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I see people in the chat. I can't see you on the screen because this is a webinar format, but I see people's names in the chat, and I'm just tickled to um, have people that I, whom I know and um, I appreciate your support. And then folks I don't know, it's really exciting to share this book with you too. Um, I'll just, I'm gonna read the book to you um, and I'll, it's a long book and it's written in layers. So this book is meant to be accessible to a variety of audiences um, with a target audience between six and nine years old, but that's kind of a stretch for some six-year-olds and it's well um, beyond informative for kids older than nine. So. Um, I'm going to read it to you like I would a child, and I will um, be editorializing in some of the pages. I want to have plenty of time afterwards um, to take your questions and to um, be able to, to tell you a little bit about Monarch Joint Venture, whose board I voluntarily chair um, precisely because I care about so much about these creatures and their ecosystems and the other creatures who live with them. So. Um, MJV does really wonderful things um, for, for conservation of monarch butterflies. And I just wanna say thanks to Wild Rumpus. Um, wonderful, wonderful to be with you today. It's a fabulous bookstore if you ever get to South Minneapolis, um, Southeast Minneapolis, Southwest Minneapolis, sorry. Um, Linden Hills, I think you guys are. Last time I was over there, it's been a while. Um, but there was a black cat there when I was there. So um, I will, um, also just tell you that in the you'll see in the chat there's a 15% off coupon and they can ship a book to you anywhere that you live. Um, I'm really excited to see we even have some people from Mexico here today. So with that, I will share my screen and get reading. 
please jot down your questions. If I can't, um, if we don't get to your question today, you can always reach out to me um, and I will get back to you. Monarch butterflies, illustrated by Olga Baumert. Okay. It all begins with an egg. The amazing life of a monarch butterfly begins with a tiny white egg hidden on the underside of a leaf. A mother monarch lays her eggs only on milkweed plants. When her caterpillar babies hatch, milkweed is all they will eat. The mother butterfly will probably lay just one egg on each plant, but in her lifetime, she will lay as many as 300 to 500 eggs. The monarch mother makes her egg sticky so that it stays on the leaf, even in the wind and the rain. The larval life. After only a few days, the tiny white caterpillar, also called a larva, nibbles its way out of its shell and wriggles onto the leaf. The caterpillar's first meal is its own eggshell. Then it will munch on milkweed nonstop for nearly two weeks, growing bigger and bigger. It will grow so much that it will molt or outgrow its skin five times. The stages between molts are called instars. Can you spot each instar? Take a peek on those pages. How is the caterpillar changing? After a day or two, the caterpillar has yellow, black, and white stripes. Tiny tentacles get larger as the caterpillar grows. When a monarch molts, it becomes wrinkly and still. It scoots out of its skin and pops off its head capsule like a face mask. The growing caterpillar eats the old skin left behind. The caterpillar will grow 2,000 times its original size. What is 2,000 times your birth weight? If you know how much you weighed. Round to the nearest whole number and then multiply that by two, double it, and then add three zeros. That's how much you would weigh if you were a fifth instar human. The anatomy of a caterpillar. I'm not gonna talk about all the parts, but there are some really cool things to note. The tentacles at the front and the back of the caterpillar are for feeling around and they're super important because these guys, if you look over on page nine, these are their eyes. They have six pair of tiny little eyes called ocelli and they really can't see worth beans as caterpillars. They have true legs at the front of their bodies and these little segmented legs will be what they um, what become their legs when they're an adult butterfly. And then these back legs, um, they have these five pair of pro legs. So is it five pair? I guess it's um, I should know this, but yes, they have one, two, three, four, and then these last ones kind of stuck at the back. Um, and they have these tiny little holes on their body that you can sort of see on the screen, but you can see it on the book if you have it in hand. Those holes are what they use to breathe with. They are spiracles, they're called spiracles. So they don't breathe through their mouths like you and I. They breathe through their skin. These little things that look like fangs here, these will be the actual antennae of the adult butterfly, which is important to note because they're not very prominent here, but they will turn into something very important when they're adults. They help them taste the milkweed um, as a caterpillar. And then they have a little spinneret here that helps them um, tether themselves to things and um, spin a silk pad. A magical metamorphosis. The full grown monarch caterpillar is finally ready to for a complete change or a metamorphosis. Not many people get to see this happen in the wild, but it's amazing to watch. First, the caterpillar climbs under a sturdy surface using its spinneret that I told you about. It spins a silk pad 
and it holds on with its last pair of legs. It sticks those legs right through that pad. The caterpillar hangs upside down in a J shape. After a day or so, the J shaped caterpillar goes limp. The tentacles become loose ringlets. Beginning at its head, its wrinkled skin begins to split open. The monarch wriggles out from its, from its rumpled skin one last time before becoming a chrysalis. The chrysalis is also called a pupa. This part of metamorphosis is called pupation. And this happens in a matter of minutes. Now let's take a look at the chrysalis, the anatomy of a chrysalis. Those same spiracles that we saw on the side of the body, that's how they breathe as a chrysalis. They hang on by this stem that they've created called a cremaster. And they have these, um, you can see right away, right away when it becomes a chrysalis, you can see its wings underneath the surface. The, this chrysalis is transparent. A lot of people think that it's just green on the outside, um, but really we can see through the pupa casing and see what's happening. And we'll talk about how, why it, how it gets its color shortly. But um, you can see those wings right away, minutes after it becomes um, a, a pupa. Monarchs are one of 300 species of butterflies around the world that rely on milkweed as caterpillars. Most of these species live in Asia and Africa, but all of them have gold dots or metallic dots on their chrysalises somewhere. So people often ask, what are those gold dots for on the chrysalis? Because they're so amazing, they're beautiful. But the truth is we don't really know. And there may, they may not be for anything, they may just be. Um, you have moles on your skin and, or freckles on your face and they're not for anything. Sometimes they just are. So they may just be. A grand entrance. When it's finally time for the monarchs to become a butterfly, the chrysalis appears to darken. Inside, the tiny scales that cover a butterfly's body and wings turn black, orange, and white. Just before it closes or hatches, the monarch draws in air through its spiracles to pop open the case so it can crawl out. And it looks like it's deformed at first. The butterfly clings to the case, its wings still crinkled. It is pumping hemolymph or insect blood from its body out to the wings. The wings unfurl like beautiful velvet. The brand new monarch hangs for several hours before flying off to look for nectar. Now we're gonna look at the anatomy of the adult butterfly and I'm not gonna read all of this, but interesting things are afoot here. And the first is that now they really do have antennae like other insects. And they really rely on these for their sense of smell. Um, they also have, as you can see on page 15, a tremendous eye. It's a compound insect eye and it has tiny, thousands of tiny lenses. And the monarch adult butterfly can see marvelously. It also has this tube-like eating mechanism and it's actually not for chewing, it's only for drinking. And what they do is they, they soak up nectar through this straw-like proboscis. And many other butterflies and moths have a proboscis, not all of them, but many of them. Did you know that some moths and butterflies don't have any mouth parts at all because they spend so little time as adults. All they do is emerge and then mate and then die. But monarchs have a lot more work to do than that. So they have a proboscis so they can drink nectar. They also have these scales all over their bodies and those, the scales help do three things. They give them their color. They give all butterflies and moths their color if they have color. Um, and they help them with, their, with lift and flying. Like an, the wings of an airplane have um, variable little uh, mechanisms for, for, you'll see on the end of the wing that change the way the wing is shaped. And then the third thing they do is help the monarchs and other butterflies and moths regulate their body temperature because these are cold blooded animals and they need to, um, they rely on the environment to regulate their temperature. Male and female, um, 
take a look at these two photos without reading the words. So step back from your computer and just glance at those two butterflies and tell me, you won't be able to tell me, but I want you to tell me in your living room or wherever you are, how they're different. What do you see that's different between those two? And I'll just give you a moment and then we'll see if we came up with the same thing. The male is up here and the female's down here. And the male you probably noticed is more brightly colored orange. She is a little bit duller. And this, you see this in the animal kingdom a lot. The females are a little bit less brightly colored and the males are more brightly colored. Another thing is this little gland, this little leftover gland, it doesn't really actually produce any scent pheromone, but um, they used to evolutionarily, and the males had these two little dots. And I learned this week what they're called and I already forgot. So, so much for that. Um, and you also may have noticed that the wing veins, which do carry hemolymph out to the body, those wing veins on the female, you see how much thicker they are? And if you spend a lot of time looking at monarchs, you'll get to see, you'll see this from far away. You won't need to see the brightness of the inside of his wings and you won't need to see those two little dots to know that it's a male or a female because these wing veins are so distinct. Marvelous milkweed. Milkweed is key to the life of a monarch. The butterfly can't survive without it. There are more than a hundred kinds of milkweed in North America alone. At first glance, they might not look much alike, but if you look very closely, you will see the things that they have in common. If you glance across this screen, like they don't look a lot alike, but the leaves are always thick and they have a vein down the middle. The bottoms of the leaves are paler than the tops. Inside the leaf is a sticky milky sap that is toxic to many animals, but not toxic to monarchs and not toxic to all animals. Monarchs do have some predators. Tiny flowers grow in clusters. Each flower has five petals pointing up and five petals pointing down. And you can do this with your hands and you can make a milkweed flower and you can test yourself when you see them blooming. They bloom usually in July. Um, and you'll come across a plant that's blooming and you'll wonder if it's a milkweed plant and you can do your test and see. Common milkweed grows in all sorts of places, prairies, ditches, roadsides, and even cracks in the sidewalk. What kinds of milkweed grow where you live? Take a sniff of their flowers, especially the common milkweed. Some milkweeds smell wonderful. After the flowers die back, long pods release fluffy seeds that float on the wind. And this is another distinct characteristic of a milkweed plant. You know it's milkweed in the fall. If you see a dead plant, dead looking plant, it's not actually dead underground, but a dead looking plant. And it has these split open pods with prickly outsides. They're not prickly to the touch, but they look prickly to the eye. Busy life in the milkweed patch. Before becoming a butterfly, a monarch caterpillar's world is the bustling milkweed patch that it shares with oodles of other creatures, many of which eat milkweed too. Bees, beetles, moths, and other butterflies drink the sweet juices of milkweed flowers. Katydids, lacewings, and leafhoppers rest on milkweed plants. A gray tree frog lies in wait to snatch up a fly for its lunch. The milkweed patch is also home to many critters that eat monarchs stink bugs, to kinid flies, fire ants, wasps, jumping spiders, all eat monarch eggs, caterpillars, and chrysalises. Summer on the wing. This is one of my favorite spreads. When a monarch becomes a butterfly, the, the life cycle begins again. A new brood of monarchs develops each month, as long as there is milkweed, until the last days of summer, these summer butterflies live for about one month as adults. They flit around gardens and fields in the endless work of survival. If you look carefully, you can be a monarch detective. What are they up to? Well, they're doing one of three things when you observe them. They're either mating or trying to mate, and that means that males are chasing the females. And if they do mate, the pair will roost 
together in a tree and stay there until the next sun, the sunrise the next day. Or the females are ovipositing, just a fancy word for laying eggs. And you can see them tuck their abdomens like this female underneath the milkweed leaf. Monarchs drink nectar. They go from flower to flower, tasting with their feet and unrolling their proboscis to drink tasting with their feet. So butterflies, moths, and flies, a lot of insects taste with their feet. So I want you to imagine what life would be like right now if you tasted with your feet. Pollinator power. While looking for nectar, monarchs help spread pollen grains from flower to flower. This is how plants make fruits and seeds. Moths, bees, flies, beetles, hummingbirds, and bats also help pollinate flowers. The journey south. In late summer, days get shorter. Nights get longer and cooler. The milkweed yellows and dries. These signals tell monarchs that winter will come and it's time to leave. They must find a place to rest until milkweed comes up in the spring. Monarchs born at this time look the same as summer butterflies, but their lives will be much different and much longer. They will live up to nine months. Instead of mating and laying eggs, these special monarchs will migrate south for winter. Over several months, monarchs soar over cities, farms, and lakes. They glide over hillsides, forests, and river valleys. Traveling some 20 miles each day, they drink from as many flowers as they can find. As they travel south, more and more butterflies join the journey. They roost at night, keep each other warm. Where do they go? The migrating monarchs have never made this trip before. How do they know where to go? Scientists have found that they use the sun and the mountains to figure out which direction to fly, but we're still not sure how they know exactly where they're going. Most monarchs east of the Rocky Mountains migrate from their summer grounds all the way to central Mexico for the winter. And they fuel up on all these plants on page 25. These are plants that bloom in the fall. And it's really important to plant, especially native plants in your area for monarchs to have at the end of summer and the beginning of fall so that they can drink nectar all the way down to Mexico because guess what? It turns out they actually gain weight on the trip and they rely on gaining weight on the trip so that they can spend their winter in Mexico. Hola, mariposa. By early November, millions of monarch butterflies begin to arrive in the mountains of central Mexico. They will settle here for the winter. Some monarchs have flown nearly 3,000 miles to get here. In Spanish, the word for butterfly is mariposa. On November 1st and 2nd, people in Mexico celebrate a holiday called the Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. They build altars called ofrenda at home and at grave sites to honor and welcome loved ones who have died. Many people believe monarchs are a symbol of the spirits of the dead coming back to visit. There are parades and parties, costumes and ceremonies, music and plenty of food, tears and laughter. A just right place. Finally, the weary monarchs can rest. They have reached the south facing slopes of Mexico's transvolcanic mountain range. These monarchs are here for the first time, but their great-great-grandparents gathered here last winter. Monarchs have probably been making this journey for thousands of years. But even in the quiet OML forest, life is hard. Some monarchs are eaten by mice or birds. Some get knocked down by storms. Others simply run out of energy and can't survive the final flight. It's spring in Mexico. As spring days get longer and warmer, the monarchs get ready to fly north again. One sunny day in March, a few butterflies take flight and begin to mate. Over the following weeks, 
Thousands of butterflies stream down the mountain sides and then lift high into the air. The tired, hungry monarchs use the last of their strength to search for nectar and milkweed as they head north to northern Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Once they've laid their eggs, the long lives of these migrators come to an end. Their children will continue the journey north, beginning the cycle all over again. Monarchs in the West. Not all monarchs migrate to Mexico. Most monarchs that live west of the Rocky Mountains fly to a different place when the nights get cold, the coast of California. They spend their winter in groves of pine, cypress, eucalyptus, and other trees. When spring comes, they fly inland again to find milkweed. Most Western monarchs migrate to California, but a few also go to Mexico. Likewise, most Eastern monarchs fly to Mexico, but a few head to California. There aren't very many Western monarchs anymore. The dry plains, big mountains, and deserts of the West make it hard for milkweed to grow. Sometimes the trees the monarchs overwinter in are cut down. Storms, droughts, floods, and wildfires are hard on them, and there aren't enough flowers to drink from. To help, many people are planting the flowers that monarchs need to survive. Monarchs in danger. Monarchs everywhere have a lot of predators, insects, spiders, birds, and mammals who eat them. Predators are natural in the cycle of wild things. But people also harm monarchs, even if they don't mean to. Sometimes monarch habitat is destroyed to build houses and roads. Many farmers use weed killers and other pesticides to grow crops, but these chemicals are poisonous to milkweed and butterflies. Some farmers plant native plants, shrubs, and flowering trees around their fields and orchards to feed the monarchs and other pollinators that help their crops grow. Those are called hedgerows. People can hurt monarchs, but people can help monarchs too. See page 38 to find out how you can help monarchs near you. Everything is connected. Monarch butterflies are both tough and delicate, tiny and tremendous. At each stage in their lives, monarchs share habitat with hundreds of other plants and animals who in turn share their worlds with hundreds more. When a monarch's habitat is poisoned or destroyed, many other important creatures struggle too. When we make sure monarchs have the milkweed, nectar flowers, and roosting trees they need, we are also caring for all the other pollinators, predators, and animals who need the same flowers and trees and each other to survive. The monarch's wrinkled stripes and royal wings remind us that we are all part of an amazing web of life. And I'm just gonna show you what's at the back of the book. This is extra, this is called back matter in the back of the book. And it's where we put all the extra stuff for you. Things like building habitat and what to know about kind of a nasty kind of milkweed. It's not nasty, but it's just not native and it's causing some trouble. Um, and how to be a citizen scientist, how to support monarchs financially, and then how to rear a monarch if you'd like to try rearing one. And then just some fun facts at the back. So, and a glossary and an index and some extra information about climate change and conservation in Mexico because conservation isn't just happening in, in the US and Canada. And then more information about Day of the Dead. So I'll um, stop sharing my screen and come back and we can take some questions. Awesome, I will jump back on here. Um, Ella, did you wanna uh, do your brief presentation now? We can let folks come up with some questions in the chat uh, and then we'll get to those questions uh, after you've had a moment. Absolutely. Yeah. That that sounds great. Excellent. Um, thanks, Timothy. And thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, it's, it's beautiful to hear it read in your voice. 
Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna share just a couple slides to talk to you about Monarch Joint Venture. Um, so, um, here we go. So uh, as was mentioned in the introductions, I am here with Monarch Joint Venture and Anne is our amazing, amazing board chair of Monarch Joint Venture. So we are a nonprofit based in St. Paul that works to protect monarchs and their migration by collaboration with partners to deliver habitat conservation, education, and science across the U.S. So partnership is a really key, key part of what we do. So we work with more than 100 partners across the United States, ranging from small, tiny nonprofits um, and even individuals up to large federal agencies like the U.S. Um, uh, Forest Service. So we work with a wide range of partners so that we can all kind of work together towards the same efforts towards monarch conservation. And you'll see we have um, kind of a focus of these different pillars of habitat conservation, education, and science. So in habitat conservation, the MJV provides a lot of technical assistance. Um, so we can provide technical assistance to individuals. Uh, so anybody who's on the call today can access our habitat help desk to um, get the questions answered about what sort of milkweed you should be putting in your yard, um, where you can find milkweed in your area. One of the other cool things that we do is we provide technical assistance to farmers. Um, so as Anne mentioned in her book, some farmers will put extra pollinator habitat in their land area. So we'll work with pollen, we'll work with farmers for that. In our education realm, we provide education for a wide range of people. So we will provide education to teachers to bring into their classroom. Um, we will provide a lot of information about how to help monarchs yourself through community science and how to um, just learn more about monarchs. And then through our science, uh, we really hold up uh, good monarch research and monarch research depends on individuals participating in community science. Um, and that can be going out into your yard and counting the number of milkweed stems that you have in your yard. And we can help you find that perfect, right uh, program to participate in for community science. I want to also, um, as the, the development director, um, one of the big ways you can help monarchs is by helping us. Um, so we welcome your financial donations, which will go directly toward that core work I talked about. And I have a link up here on the screen and I'll pop it in the chat. And this is actually, um, uh, goes to a page for that highlights Anne's book. And we are encouraging today, the first um, donors who donate $100 will get a signed copy of Anne's book generously donated by her. Um, other ways you can support the MJV and thereby support Monarchs is to follow and share our social media. You'll see on our social media accounts that we have a ton of information. You can attend our trainings and events. You can contact our pollinator help desk, as I had mentioned, and then you can participate in community science. And I'll pop a couple links into the chat for those options. Um, our website, I highly encourage you to pop over to our website. There is a ton, a ton of information that you can find on our website. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions about MJV and uh, any other questions about Monarchs that Anne doesn't answer, but hopefully Anne answers most of those. Awesome. Hey. Thank you for sharing that, Ella. Um, and I think there are some, uh, Kara was dropping some links in the chat as well. Um, so take a look there. Uh, and to everyone that's joined us today, um, again, feel free to uh, drop questions in the chat or the Q&A and uh, we will get to that. Um, I wanted to, well, first of all, I wanted to say just how beautiful this book is. It's just like the colors are gorgeous. It's huge, uh, which means that it's very detailed. Um, both in the images and then also the information that is uh, included in there. It's really, really fabulous. It's a great resource. Uh, it's also just a great story. Um, so uh, thank you for sharing it with us, Anne. Um, I wanted to ask, um, just to kind of get us started, um, do you have uh, an ecologist origin story? Do you have a, a moment you first realized that um, you uh, were fascinated with the natural world uh, or with monarch butterflies in particular? 
Well, I was raised in a neighborhood that, although it was somewhat urban, was absolutely surrounded by woods, and I lived outside my whole growing up. And there were some abandoned railroad tracks and um, and um, lots where houses used to be like a long time ago. Um, it was near the St. Paul campus, and we had a lot of milkweed that grew. So I absolutely brought in. I remember just finding those big, juicy, beautiful fourth and fifth in stars. I never noticed them when they were smaller than that because I don't think my child eyes were looking that carefully, but um, I definitely reared them. And I remember getting painted ladies mysteriously once in the mail too from someone when I was a kid and thinking those were fascinating to rear. I don't know much about, I didn't know much about their natural habitat. Um, and I discourage you from getting any monarchs or butterflies in the mail. Just not a good idea, not good, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then when I was a classroom teacher, um, Karen Oberhauser, who is a tremendous monarch scientist in the field, her kids went to the school where I taught fifth grade and Kathy McCann is on and I had her, I can't believe she's here today. She, I had her son, Josh, I think it was my first year. And um, uh, Karen and I got acquainted and then uh, she offered to come talk to my class and bring some eggs with her. And lo and behold, like everybody was hooked. And so I did it every year while I was in the classroom and the kids would arrive on the first day and there would be monarch eggs in our, in our classroom. So we reared them and we tagged them and we released them. And, um, and then Karen and I really hit it off and she invited me to help be part of an NSF grant she received to write curriculum so that she didn't have to go to everybody's classroom. The teachers could teach each other and in order to teach kids. And they're just a really compelling and, and wonderful um, um, tool for teaching K-12 science. And everything we do as we read, everything we do for monarchs is related to and intertwined with, with the well-being of other organisms. So they lend themselves really readily to ecology. So that's my origin story. Excellent. Yeah. Um was it uh, challenging and it, was it challenging to write engaging nonfiction for young readers? Uh, and someone in the chat asked, you know, about the writing process. So I think that kind of ties. Yeah. In. So I actually, this book kind of, um, the original outline for the book that the story gave me, and they'll tell you this, um, was not at all how I would write the book. So when we talked about it, I said, no, this is your outline. And that outline just spilled right out of me. So I felt the spreads were actually pretty, they just fell out. And, and I had a, a, the writing process was not difficult for me. What was difficult for me is that I tend to put too many words on paper. And that's where a, a, a really talented editor comes in. And I had one, she was tremendous. Um, and I didn't really realize that what, what I think is remarkable about the book writing process in this day and age, and this was pre COVID, is that we wrote this book and illustrated this book all over email. So I never spoke after the initial conversation with story publishing, I never spoke to any of these people and I didn't speak to or even meet my illustrator until last week. <laughs> I've never spoken to her. I emailed her directly after the book was published because um, I, I sent her some flowers because I was so in love with her work and I was so happy when the book came out. And I got that first copy in the mail and I cried and I was like, I, on our publishing date, I'm sending her flowers and she lives in the UK. So, um, but Olga was, we met last week and we did a podcast with the publisher and we had a blast and a half. It was so fun to meet her. She, I can tell you her favorite spreads was Day of the Dead. She loves painting people in costumes. Um, she is a botanical, you know, that's her, she collects vintage botanical books. And so she's really fascinated with plants. And then she, um, the hardest spread for her was the anatomy of the caterpillar because it made her dizzy. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about the book process. I wrote most of this book at our family cabin over the course of one week. I mean, it was the whole book was, took a lot longer than that to write, but it, a lot of it came out in that week of a family vacation where I wasn't, you know, my family will tell you I was in my, it wasn't COVID and I was in my pajamas all day <laughs> writing this book, so. That's excellent. Uh, I'm glad that you brought up the uh, the illustrator because uh, I think with a book like this, the illustrations are really crucial, uh, both uh, to you know engaging the audience, but also to um, to help readers identify both monarch butterflies and then uh, flowers to feed them, uh, things like milkweed, 
Um, so can you talk a little bit more about uh, working with the illustrator, how you uh, collaborated? Um, and um, I think you had mentioned that you maybe had some uh, draft uh, some drafts yeah, I was going to share a draft. This is a really good idea. So Olga hadn't seen, I'll share my screen again. She hadn't seen, you know, she lives in the UK, so they don't have the same species there and she um, doesn't necessarily know them. So um, I had to send a lot, I, I sent files and files of reference photos for every spread. A spread is the left, right page in a book and the one they had we had titles for them like the just right place where they were in Mexico so we would work on the book a spread at a time and not necessarily in sequential order and I would just I had a file of resources for her so this is a really great example um this slide of back and forth I kept do you, I'm going to let you look at it for a second and see what's different in the final version mm -hmm. Um, I had to keep going back to the picture of the Eastern gray tree frog. Um, so to get that right, because you see these guys on milkweed, Carol is here from Canada and she'll tell you, she'll agree that these little Eastern gray tree frogs, um, they love to hang out on milkweed leaves. Um, so I didn't want it to just be a frog. I wanted it to be this specific frog. And then, um, you know, just making sure um, you might not have noticed that there are holes out of these. And it was actually Wendy Caldwell, who's the executive director of MJV, who looked at this drawing and she said, um, actually she looked at the spread finished and she said, and there are, there are no bites out of those milkweed plants. And I was just aghast that I hadn't caught it myself. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. So then I went back to Olga and I'm like, they need to have been eaten. And here's that, you know, there's a, there's a certain shape that monarchs give to them, but other things eat them in a different shape. And so I was describing the shapes of the holes and, and I kept going back to her more, more, they need more eaten from them. So um, we, uh, we, we finally got it. But you can see the before and the after, like she didn't put in the background until after we were sure the spreads were right. So, um, and then this one is another good example. Um, I was talking to another friend about this. I'm like, it's just not right. It's just looks too much like if you've seen Star Wars, Jabba the Hutt, or um, it's just too fat. So she's like, yeah, it's like, it needs to be, pull up, pull up its petticoats, pull up the petticoat a little bit. And I was like, oh, that is kind of, that's a pretty good description. Pull up the petticoat. And then it had too many, its, it's legs were too um, much like these true legs, right? These segmented legs. And I'm like, no, they're more like suction cups. So um, we went back and forth with with those kinds of things. I was going to show you one spread from Mexico. I went to the overwintering sites right before COVID hit. This is what I spent my advance money on. When you write a book, you get an advance of your future earnings on the book. So um, I spent my advance money on a trip to go see, to finish the story for myself and go see where they overwinter. And I saw that one of the questions, they take you up, there are about 14 different sites where they over over winter and it's not always exactly in the same place um but they just cluster through the trees and they, they're just laden the trees are laden with monarchs but um this video will give you a sense of what it looks like there as far as the eye can see all those little orange things everywhere just <laughs> weighing down the trees in these very specific sites where you have to, you know, there are a lot of rules about not touching and being quiet. You can hear us whispering. But somebody asked about the Day of the Dead and how it relates. Um, the Day of the Dead is a combination of the Mesoamerican native first peoples, the Aztecs and the, um, the other, um, the Toltecs. Um, they had, they believed in, in that monarchs were a symbol of, of, the, of the, the spirits of the dead the souls of the dead. And you can see it in some of their um, writings and their petroglyphs, hieroglyphs. Um, but the, the Spanish conquistadors also believed in some kind of, you know, the all saints and the, um, um, the, the renewal that happens um, with the, the Christian calendar year. Um, and we have the related Halloween but at any rate, um, the monarchs arrived down in Mexico, and there's more about this right here. But they arrived down in Mexico um, at this 
at the that early November, late October, early November. So it does they, their arrival coincides with um, the celebration of the Day of the Dead. So they are related um, in in so far as um, Mexican culture is concerned. That spread about them in the in the uh, my friend Ellen, who Ellen um, runs the Ellen Sharp runs. Um, a, a nonprofit in Mexico trying to protect those forests from poachers and um, it's it's um, butterflies and their people. And she looked at that spread because she was one of my expert readers and she's like, oh, it's really not like that. That's it, people, are, there's, there are not, there's not a mariachi band in the graveyard and that would really offend people here. But we decided to leave it because it's so whimsical and it's a blend of um, how it's celebrated elsewhere in Mexico with um, the, you know, they're definitely graves um, decorated with flowers, marigolds, and and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I really love the information uh, about Dia de los Muertos in this book because it really gives a sense of how um, the life cycle of monarchs uh, is sort of synced up with the the life cycle of humans as well, um, which really drives home the the fact that we are all connected. Um, and you know. I just I want to acknowledge again. I know that uh, Kara dropped it in the chat. We do have people uh, from all over North America that are joining in today, which is just fabulous. Like um, so, um, can you talk a little bit more about some of those? Uh, like, are there other um, like cultural, uh, you know, events or like traditions related to monarch butterfly monarch you know, butterflies that you did? I don't know. I do know that there are a lot of um, that among. Um, um, Latinx communities that are related to Mexico across the country. Um, there are, there's a lot of pride in celebrating the Day of the Dead and fall celebrations that include, you know, monarch costumes. So I can only tell you there's a strong, there's a strong, um, like a, there's a big preschool program in Chicago. We have a lot of people who've taken our workshops in Chicago and they just all seem to, to do a fall related dressing up like monarchs thing. And it's particularly in our, the Spanish speaking preschool community. So, um, but I don't know. I mean, I know, I know that they're symbolic for a lot of people in Mexico. I know it's more than just the, the region where the monarchs overwinter. Um, but um, I, I think it's, oh yeah, there's more and there's more. Thanks for posting it in the chat. Um, I'm seeing all these other questions too. Absolutely, yeah, I do wanna to get to- I uh, really some, questions. Uh, to some of those and- you know, I will just, tell you though, I wanna say one more thing, Tim, which is yeah, that yeah. My, my son's uh, um, high school orchestra and band teacher approached me and we've been meeting because he wants to commission a composer, a national level composer to compose a piece for high school orchestra that um, is based on the book. And we talked about all those symbolic pieces that it's that it's cultural and it's also us coming out of a pandemic and, um, and us dealing with um, a transformation of transformation within our society around issues of violence against and exclusion of, um, of people of color. And um, there are a lot of different themes of the day that that tie nicely in with um, the the and including including all the environmental issues. Um, they just all it just seems to be um, it seems to be a great allegory for bigger things. Absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions in the chat uh, was about how high the monarchs go uh, when they're flying to and from yeah. Mexico. Yeah, Ella, do you know how high they go? I mean, I know that I've known. I, I know they ride the thermals. So however, they take advantage of Southern um, moving warmer air, but I'm not a meteorologist and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's dang high. Like I wanna say a mile up to, you know, but you also sometimes see them flying, Ella? Um, so we, with the human eye, can see them when they fly up to 300 feet, but they fly up to um, 800 to 1200 feet. All right, so that's not a mile, <laughs> much lower than a mile. But I mean, it's higher than I can fly, so. Higher than I can fly, too. <laughs> 
request. Um, can you also describe uh, how to uh, tag a monarch? Uh, and yeah. also, um, I think with that, um, I think we it'd be great to drop something in the chat about uh, becoming a citizen scientist uh, as well. And yeah, you know, so some, talking about that. At the back of the book, there's a piece on on tagging, and I want to make the point that um, that there are a couple of different. Um, you can track the migration of monarchs with a really cool program that tracks migrations of many species and tracks the the um, the uh, phenology, the seasonal science of different plants and animals. And that's called Journey North, and that's on page 45. And then Monarch Watch is um, for the population east of the Rockies um, through um, the University of Kansas. And you, you get tags by contacting them. They have a program and you buy the tags, which covers the cost of, you know, the administrative cost of, of doing it. And they'll send you the tags and you only would tag the fall, the ones that emerge at the end of summer, late August, early September. And each tag has a discrete number on it. And a, you have a record sheet that you write down, you know, I used tag, this tag number uh, and I put it on a butterfly on this date in this location. So you'll end up with extra tags and you can't use them next year or it's gonna mess up the, mm. the, the data, but they'll give you all that information. I would like to make the point that as some people have pointed out to me since reading the book, um, that it isn't legal to tag them in every state. There are in, in California, they're so endangered that Western population is down 99.9% .9 over 20 years ago. Like they are, monarchs did qualify for becoming an endangered species recently, but sadly there are so many other species ahead of them that, that, that they're, they're being included on that list is precluded and, and we'll have to wait a few years until we get some other species out of, out of, the, out of the zone. Um, but um, because of that, certain states have said, we have so few here that you're not even allowed to rear them. So um, you can find out if your state, if it's legal in your state. And then the Southwest Monarch study is for Western monarchs and Arizona. Um, and then Monarch Alert is specifically for California. So um, you'll wanna look at where you live in terms of whether or not you wanna participate in that. Um, we do have a lot of day, people love to tag monarchs. <laughs> But it's not the most important of all the citizen science um, and, and all the things you can do for monarchs. It's, um, it's really what's most vital is for you to plant milkweed and native milkweed mm -hmm. and plants that they can nectar from. I mean, that I can't emphasize that enough. And I've included Xerxes at the back of the book, but Xerxes will give you, Xerxes Society website has super cool information on how to garden for butter for monarchs. Um, how to garden for pollinators and then how to garden for monarchs specifically. And they'll give you, um, it's super cool chart. You put in where you live, you choose your region, and then it gives you a list of plants and you can see by season, like by month when they bloom. So if you wanna have something blooming in and what color they are, how tall they are and all that stuff. So you can really plan a garden that always has something for pollinators in it. Absolutely. I was really excited about that. Uh, personally, my partner and I have been uh, planting a, a lot of gardens. I built a lot of raised garden beds a couple of weeks ago. So we're really excited about getting a lot of uh, those flowers uh, planted in our yard. So, Can I also mention um, regarding the tagging and buying plants for um, monarchs? Um, in August, August 21st, um, MJV will have an event out in Foley, Minnesota with Minnesota Native Landscapes. Um, so it is the time period when the monarchs are starting their migration down. Um, so we have an event that takes place in Monarch, or in, I'm sorry, in Minnesota Native Landscapes, Leatris Field, and the field is filled to the brim with monarchs. It is a really neat opportunity. Um, but we will, at that event, we will have tagging demonstrations. So we can show you how the tagging happens um, and talk to you a little bit more about it. It's a, it is a lovely, amazing event. Awesome. Sounds Wait, like those of you who are a... out sorry. of state should come visit. They should, it's, it's the closest you're gonna, I mean, it's really like there are monarchs, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of monarchs and they're it's just super fun. And the liatris is this tall, late blooming, late summer blooming um, purple flower. And this is where they cultivate them for sale. So it's like 
you know, you got a whole farm field full of these gorgeous purple flowers. That's awesome. Um, great. We just have a couple of minutes left. I think that we've gotten to everything in the chat. Um, I hope someone will nudge me if I missed something. Uh, but uh, to kind of cap things off, I have kind of a dual question, um, uh, which is, you know, is there anything that really surprised you about uh, the bookmaking process? Uh, and then with that is, uh, are you taking that into other book projects? Are you working on uh, something else that we should be on the lookout for? Well, I'm, I'll, I'll answer the first question first. Yeah. Um, what surprised me the most was what I think I shared earlier, which was just that I didn't get to meet the illustrator and that that we that we were able to write a book all electronically just blew my mind. Olga's artwork she does with watercolors, gouache, colored pencil, um, but then they get scanned in and she can then tweak them a little bit. She was able to add those bite marks, for example. Um, but all of this, the editing and the the organizing and the communication, I also didn't really know what an art director was or why you would. I mean, I thought it was an editor, an illustrator, and, a, and an author. And the, the, the art director is really the, is really like the conductor of the orchestra. And she just did a masterful job. And I even pushed back on a few things with the book that I, at first I was like, oh, I'm not so sure about a pink background behind those, that caterpillar on that anatomy page. I just doesn't work for me. Well, when I got the book in hand, it, it all works. It works, works with the whole retro feel of this book. That was, that's all her. The art director is the reason this has a canvas cover. It's the reason that you, those orange dots are throughout the book with extra little facts. Mm -hmm. It's the reason there's a whole section of back matter at the back and that there's a glossary and a table of contents. Those are all decisions that the art director makes. And I had no idea that the art director, so they don't get much credit. And I should have thanked her in my credits and I didn't, but um, I had an amazing art director for this book. As for next projects, yes, I wanna do a book of, I'm really interested in, in when I could have written a whole book about the milkweed patch and I won't because I don't think that would be so enticing to children. But I do want to, along the same vein, do a cross section book of microclimates. So, and my current thought is around in, in all the national, not all, and I've picked out a list of national forests to go do this in. But um, what's going on at the base of a redwood tree? Like what is going on above ground and underground? Who lives there? These are little organisms and you know, they're fascinating. Um, a tide pool in Acadia. Um, a, a, a coyote den in, um, in the Sonoran Desert or you know, a, a, just, just the base of a, the base of a saguaro cactus. What's going on below the surface and above the surface? Who lives there and what are they doing? So that's, um, that's, that's the concept for my next book. So don't steal my concept, please. <laughs> no, I, I haven't I had time to, to start researching it yet. Maybe when I'm, yeah, we'll see. Excellent. Well, I'm excited about that. Um, this yeah. book um, is gorgeous. Like you said, the, the art direction is phenomenal. It's such a pleasure to hold uh, as a book. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, so I really encourage uh, everyone who's here today, uh, the link is in the chat to buy the book. Uh, don't forget to grab that 15% um, off code that will uh, expire in a month. Um, so grab that from the chat. Um, Anne, thank you. Ella, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of all of you being here. I'm just so tickled that that people came and let me share my book with you. So thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, and again, check out all of those links that we dropped in the chat uh, to Monarch Joint Venture, all of those resources. Thanks again, everyone, gonna, for coming. And I'm going to quickly, just before we, I'm going to put my email in here in case people have more questions. They want to email me directly or they want to complain about something or suggest <laughs> something. They can do that too. Excellent. So, there we awesome. go. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining from all over North America. Thanks for spending your afternoon with us. I hope you have a great day. Uh, go out there and plant some pollinator and uh, some plants for pollinators. Um, and take care, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you.